I'm Juliette Ryan Davis, and I'm a geologist here at the U.S. Geological Survey. Yeah, so I'm Walter Mooney. I'm a seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. I'm Dr. Margaret Mangan. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey and the scientist in charge of the California Volcano Observatory here in Menlo Park, California. Everybody is interested in volcanoes. Uh, I think from a young age, uh, people are captivated by the, the vol voluminous uh, magma and molten rock that uh, are spewed out of some volcanoes and the ash. And so people are really drawn to uh, have a better understanding of volcanoes, what's their likelihood of erupting, and, and so on. And so USGS uh, has the privilege of informing people through a number of means. The most effective, in my view, is video, because uh, a volcano is not stagnant. There's actually a lot to be seen there. So uh, cameras are placed on, uh, on the site of all volcanoes uh, that are likely to be active, and people can actually go online and, and watch the, the, that camera. And then, of course, there are regular bulletins that are issued by the um, scientists in charge of each of the volcano centers regarding the hazard. Volcano hazard maps, which show zones, a, you know, red zones are those where you don't really want to be when there's a volcanic eruption, and they grade away until you get to a safer and safer zone. And, and these are um, made uh, easily available. In the case of being in a volcanic uh, region, every hotel will have a map on the, in the lobby or some of them will even have the map in, in the room so people know, you know uh, what their situation is and they can take appropriate action. There are a lot of different potential volcanic hazards. There are hazards that people face from volcanic ash and volcanic tephra which is the stuff that comes out of the volcano and goes into the air. It's very light and it's often really fine particles of glass and crystals and things like that. And that can get into airplane engines and it can coat uh, people's farmlands which will damage their crops that year. And it can actually, on, in a big volcanic eruption, it gets into the atmosphere, it can circle the earth and change the climate. It's also a breathing problem if you're in an active volcanic eruption area uh, and there's a lot of ash, that's, that causes a lot of problems for people. But then the sort of more dramatic seeming things are lava flows. They end up being sometimes not quite as big of an immediate hazard. People can kind of, can kind of avoid those oftentimes or at least uh, have some fair warning because they're not moving incredibly quickly. There's more uh, difficult to avoid would be a pyroclastic flow, so a really big, fast, hot flow of volcanic material that happens much more explosively and suddenly. So those are pretty, pretty dangerous for people, and if you were in the path of where a pyroclastic flow is going, you wouldn't have much chance of escaping. The long-term forecasting comes from research projects of what uh, outlining, discovering what the volcano has done in the past. And so we have a slew of volcanologists that go out in the field at these volcanic centers and look at the deposits that were created when the volcano erupted hundreds of years, thousands of years, even millions of years ago. And that provides an understanding on the likelihood of a future eruption. The second thing we do is short-term forecasting. And the short-term forecasting is done by listening to what our sensors in the field are telling us. Looking at the data that comes in 24-7 from our seismometers, our ground deformation instruments, and what I call our gas sniffers. And that allows us to understand the short-term behavior of a volcano. The study of volcanology is important because people want to first understand their environment. So that we can help 
um, prevent any really great damage to uh, from occurring and also prevent people's lives from being lost. But it also speaks to our ability to do fantastic thinking in support of human existence.